The next half hour or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about MGI as what we are doing here, where does the data come from, what does it look like, what will happen next, um, to give you a, a little bit of a look under the hood for those of you who might not have as good connections to others as Kristen does, um, and also to allow you to help us do better, right? Because a lot of these processes, we are thinking this is probably the best way to do it, but and most of us here are also doing, so for example, my group and several other people are also using MGI for research, but obviously all of you are using MGI for research or want to do so. So helping us doing the things that we, showing us the things that we could do better would be very useful. So it would be great if we have afterwards about 15 minutes budgeted for discussion, so it would be great if you can uh, contribute there. I want to get started by pointing out that I'm acting in PowerPoint. Um, other people are actually doing the work in uh, the biostatistics unit. That's primarily Anita Pandit and Brad van der Werft, um, who are, Anita is uh, answering um, requests and is helping with the analysis, and Brad is doing all the work that happens under the hood, which is QC, data quality control, and similar work. Then we have Sneel Patil, who does um, programming and uh, works, for example, on the Encore project. Lars and Nat are the faculty advisors who have been on MGI longer than me and almost everybody. So they know where all the corpses are buried and that is a very useful skill. And finally, Mike helps us going in the right direction. Um, it is also important for me to point out that when you interact, you will interact with data direct. They are the people who actually create the phenotype files that you want to analyze. And uh, here I want to especially emphasize Aaron and Anisa who are, Anissa, I think, sorry, um, <laughs> who um, are extremely helpful, and Justin, who does a lot of the customized data polls. And finally, I want to um, give a shout out to Cynthia, who is basically keeping us all going in the same direction, and I think herding cats can't be any easier than that. Um, okay, so what are we talking about when talking about Precision Health? Uh, Precision Health is a very big cross-campus initiative that is supported by the provosts and deans of Michigan Medicine, Michigan Engineering, and Michigan Public Health. And the goal here is to create a data resource for interdisciplinary health research, right? For Michigan Medicine, it has long been a standard to use medical records for their research, but here the goal is to sort of open up this resource to the whole of the university. Um, and um, there's a lot of efforts going on there, but really, the primary goal is to make 4 million patient records available for research throughout the campus. A subset of that, and the subset we're talking about today, is the Michigan Genomics Initiative. Um, these are individuals who are not just patients in Michigan, but people who have particularly consented for research, and those are very broad consents, that include the permission to recontact them, that also includes the permission to take their Michigan health data and connect it to other databases, like death registries or I guess in principle the Amazon account if we wanted to and could. Um, for all of these people, we have a blood draw and so can generate genotype data. Um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 80,000 people enrolled and about 60,000 people being genotyped. And because these individuals can be recontacted, and because these are high value individuals, there's additional effort in generating more broad phenotype data for them like geolocation data that tells you something about how um, affected by uh, environmental toxins they are, and a lot of other data. Um, a major weakness of this resource is that it's not diverse, um, as you can see here, and it's not a random population sample. So far, the individuals that are in the present freeze two are, have been primarily collected through anesthesiology, so they're mostly, um, um, they had major surgeries at the University of Michigan. The sample size of the present freeze is roughly 50,000 people at a median age of 57 and a little bit more than half are female. But as I said, the biggest weakness you can see in this bar chart that might get me disbarred from biostatistics, uh, in this um, pie chart that might get me disbarred from biostatistics, um, that really over 90% of the sample are European and a very, very small um, subset of other populations. Um, as I said, it is important to understand how the process works. They're basically, if you want data, there are two units, if you want genetic data, 
There are two units involved in there. The first one is data direct. And their job is to curate all the phenotype data. And if your goal is to identify the people you want to study based on some phenotypes, they will help you identify your cohort. They will also work with you on your request, though we work with them, so it might, Anita might end up working on your request too. And, but the critical point is those are the only people who see uh, protected health information. The goal is to keep protect patients, as I mentioned initially. So protected health information resides in one unit. We don't get to see it over here. Only Data Direct sees that. On the other hand, there's the biostatistics team, which is us. We curate the genetic data. We support research design. So if you want to do a genetic study, we help you with setting that up. But we don't have any access, access to PHI. So if you request data, your request will always go to Data Direct first. They will create your cohort. And that cohort will go to us, and we will collect the genotype information and make that available to you. Um, how do we get to that genotype information? As I said initially, the people who are consented for MGI provide a blood sample, which goes to the central biorepository, and from there to the advanced genomics core. Um, there they are genotyped on a affordable genome-wide uh, Chip solution, so far we have been using the Illumina human core exome. And once that genotyping has happened, the results go to us and we do quality control, we do genotype imputation, and we provide the, um, as I said, the help with the analysis. So with this preamble, I now want to give you a rough idea what, I'm, what the rest of my talk is going to be about. Basically, I want to give, walk you quickly through what we're doing right now. Then I want to sort of give you what happens next, what is the upcoming things that we're already working on. And then finally, I want to put out a couple of ideas that we consider working on and could um, invest man hours in. But we would need to have some kind of idea that that would actually be considered useful before we do that. OK, so what do we do right now? It's actually a relatively long list. First is simplest, we give you your data. Second one is we do the genotype calling and we do the quality control. We also phase the data and impute it. We do support in your study design. We do some additional downstream analysis, right? You don't only use genetic data itself. We also use the genetic data to identify population membership. We use it to create uh, covariates for genetic analysis in form of PCAs. And we identify related individuals. We also manage additional genetic data. And I'll explain in a second what that means. And finally, we have created the FeeWeb fee as a resource for people to look at first pass analyses of the genome. OK. So when we make data available, we have a couple of formats. Um, our default format that we're think, thinking of is the filtered set of imputed markers. And these are markers after imputation, after some quality control <coughs> measures. Um, that's a set of 23 million markers. That's a, that's a, a data, the file is about one terabyte large. <coughs> so this is the default set if somebody wants genetic data that we think about, but of course, as I said, the QC criterion here are a little bit arbitrary. You might think, for example, a minor allele frequency cutoff of 10 to the minus 4 is too lenient um, or too strict. And we can give you the whole data set, and you can assign your, the whole imputed data set, and you can assign your own cutoffs. Or if you don't believe our phasing and imputation, we can also just give you the chip genotypes after our QC, and you can run your own analysis of that data. Now, as you've heard earlier, there is um, some, some, of the research, some of the researchers working with us do not need um, 23 million markers, they need five. So for those researchers, if you give us a list of either as RS numbers or as just as geno genomic coordinates, we're happy to give you just a, a list of genotypes. Um, our default format in which we provide the data is a VCF because that's sort of industry standard. But uh, we, have, we, we are happy to work with you to um, create some other formats that might be useful for you. What is important also in, in the future, so far all the data we're providing is based on Genome Build 37. Okay, the next thing is, as I said, we're doing a statistical genetic support. Uh, we support studies that, that, remember, the idea of MGI is to make genetics available to everybody, and everybody includes people with limited experience in genetic analysis. So to help individuals, uh, to help researchers uh, of, of, of that type, 
we have helped them with a lot of aspects of their genetic analysis. That includes, make, does this study make sense? Right? Because a lot of people on our team have experience with genetic analysis and they just know, will this work or not? Um, how can we help you to identify controls? Uh, earlier we've had, heard about how some groups have done that, but not everybody has the experience on how to correctly identify your controls. How to test appropriately, how to correct for population stratification. Um, in some cases, we have simply run the genome-wide association study for individuals that were interested. And of course, we're also happy to help you interpret your results and tell you what plausible next steps may be. Um, this can be a lot of work on this list. Um, so the more complicated the request is, the more we cannot promise that we can always do it multiple times. So we're, for example, happy to run one genome-wide analysis for you, but if you want to tweak the phenotype five times and have rerun run the GWAS every time, our response time is going to get slower on that. Okay, other things that we're doing, more technical things, is phasing and imputation. We're using EAGLE2, which is an industry standard, to phase autosomes in the X chromosomes. We impute missing genotypes uh, using MINIMAC4, also an industry standard. The template we've been using so far is the Haplotype Reference Consortium. Uh, which uh, allows us to impute about 40 million variants. Um, as I mentioned before, we do some QC on those. In particular, we remove variant with estimated correlation coefficient below 0.3 or that have an allele frequency less than 10 to the minus 4, which is how we result in the data set of 23 million variants that I mentioned earlier. Um, as a metagenetic analysis, right now we're basically doing three things. One is we estimate the global ancestry so that for every individual in your study you have an idea, is this European ancestry or is this from, an, from another group? We also perform a principal component analysis. This is, a, as you all know, a standard way to correct for population stratification. And finally, we um, calculate a kinship coefficient and what you can see, see here on the right side um, is all the family relationships <coughs> we have identified in our MGI data set. We have a little bit under, I think, roughly 1,500 uh, parent offspring pairs in uh, MGI and about the same number of siblings, sibling pairs and a little more uh, second degree relationships. So we have a decent number of related individuals. And if you want to, for example, avoid related individuals in your data, then again, this is information that would be useful for you. And if you have asked for permission to get the genetic data, you can of course also get all our metagenetic analysis. Um, as I said, we administer return data. Um, as we've said a couple of times, blood samples in the biobank are available if any of you want to do a sequencing experiment. However, if you get those blood samples, you will sign something that you will return the data to us, assuming you're creating high value information. Um, so we are taking care of that data and making that data available to other groups. Um, the only data set where that happened so far is the data set Kristen has described earlier. Um, one thing I'm a little bit confused is Kristen described about 500 individuals. And my understanding is we have about 260, so we have to figure out. OK, so the MGI individuals of Kristen, so that is good. So these are individuals that have whole exome sequencing, high quality whole exome sequencing, about 260 individuals. We have the BAM files and the VCF files. A small challenge here is that um, BAM files are a lot and are big files, and they may include uh, uh, personal health information, mostly medical record numbers. So we have to, when we get that data returned, make sh before, before we give it out to somebody, we have to make sure there's no personalized health information in for it. And that's what we're doing right now. We have that data available in this, this winter. If you want data like that, you have to request it through the normal processes, right? Just because you have permission to get, for example, the GWAS data, does not get you also automatic permission to get that data. You need to request it. But that should be fast once you have a process going. Another resource uh, that uh, our, our department has provided is the FeeWeb. Um, this is a Basically, what we have done is we have run a genome-wide analysis against every fee code that was available from the data on all the individuals. 
um, that allows you to do a very quick scan. If you're just thinking, I'm interested in this, let's see what does the first pass analysis look like. So it allows you to basically do a first pass analysis on any fee code, or look at a first pass analysis of any fee code that exists in, uh, in the database and see what are the, what are the findings in MGI. Um, so if you go to FeeWeb and you, for example, put on a disease, like in this case, skin cancer, you would get here the Manhattan plot of all the findings uh, that we had in MGI for skin cancer. If you then click on one of the peaks, or in principle on any other one of those dots, you'll be taken to a, a locus zoom plot of that particular, of that particular uh, locus. So here you have again the index snip, which is the most significant one, and then this looks like a standard locus zoom plot. Again, if you click here on, for example, the index snip, you can then see for everything, for every other trait MGI, in MGI, for every other phenocode, what is the evidence that this variant affects any other trait. So for example here, every one of these dots, every one of these colors here at the bottom, unfortunately you can't really read this, are different categories of, of traits. Um, and every one here of these dots is the association of this highly significant skin cancer locus with that trait. So you can see here's a large group of um, traits that are all associated, significantly associated with that skin cancer locus. And they're all roughly what you would expect, right? Skin cancer is the highest. The next one is melanoma. Um, and all the other ones are also skin-related skin related traits. But this, this way allows you to quickly see if any trait you found of interest is sort of affecting other, other um, phenotypes as well. OK. So far, the existing version of um, FeeWeb is only using Freeze 1 information, so only about 20,000 individuals. Information for Freeze 2 has been generated and will be put in the website soon. So again, we expect that in, in the next couple of months. OK, so this was what's happened so far. Now I'm going to go into what will happen next. And there are basically four things I'm going to highlight. The first one is we may finally get the ability and permission to impute with TopMed. Then we are working right now very hard on a new data freeze. Uh, we also are working on Encore, which is software that would allow you to do your genetic analysis easier. And finally, um, we, have, we are in the middle of ordering new chips, so we will get more genotype data even beyond the new data freeze relatively shortly. OK, so TopMed top imputation. Um, studies, including a little bit over 95,000 individuals, have signed off and given permission to use their uh, data in a TopMed imputation server that will go, by all we can tell, online next month probably. Um, this is, on the one hand, a substantially larger <coughs> template size than what we've been using so far. The Unum Gene Diversity Panel that I mentioned before has less than 40,000 individuals. Uh, more importantly, it's a much more diverse panel. Um, TopMed has about 20% Latinos and 30% African Americans, so it will substantially help our imputation here. If you want to have a rough idea how much this helps, here is work that Santi Das has done with a smaller subset of TopMed, so this is for only 65,000 individuals. The blue line here is the Haplotype Reference Consortium, so that's the data we've been using so far. And the green line here is TopMed, <coughs> and the red line is 1,000 genomes. Only. And what you can see in Europeans is for frequent variants, so variants above a frequency of 1%, we're not really expecting much of an improvement. But for variants below 1%, we're expecting that using top mid, our imputation is going to get substantially more precise. Uh, the effect is much, much bigger in African Americans, where you can see overall our precision so far has not been great. But by um, including uh, or by using top mid for imputation, we expect that our imputation accuracy will go up considerably across the entire frequency spectrum. OK, here the timeline is um, as soon as the um, TopMed server will be available, we will re-impute Freeze 2 with the new panel. TopMed lives on Human Genome Build 38. That means the re-imputed panel will be on Build 38. Um, as I said, it should go online next month. It has been a long process, so I'm not sure how much I believe that. We're pretty optimistic, but not perfectly. But we're hoping to have this done in winter 2020. 
if we have it done and you are using the full data dump from us, the whole genome, we will send you an, an email and you can have the updated information. Uh, you can download the updated information. Um, okay. Next thing we're working on is Data Freeze 3. Up to now, there's about 10,000 more individuals, over more than 10,000 individuals have been genotyped but have not been part of Freeze 2. So now we are running a Freeze 3 of about 60,000 individuals. Uh, when we're running a freeze, what we're doing is we're doing reclustering and we're doing, um, we're creating, as Chris mentioned earlier, we're creating our own clustering files to optimize the quality of the genotyping, particularly for rare variants. And we're calling variants. We're also making sure to um, even out uh, any batch effects that might have happened based on what day the genotyping happened or any, any other effect there. Um, this freeze, once we have a basic freeze, we're going to use imputation. By the time it's done, we can hopefully impute both with TopMed and with the Human Reference Consortium panel. So we will do both, and we'll make those available. Right now, we're hoping to have it done by January 31st, um, and we will um, send an information to all MGI users. However, if you want to use that data, you will need to submit a new request through JIRA. Again, if you already have ongoing projects, that should be relatively painless but we need to keep track on who uses what data. Okay, next thing we're working on, I'm moving a little bit further in the future and when we hope to have this done, is Encore. Um, some of you might know Encore is a web-based GWAS server that has been developed in Gonzalo's lab. Um, Matt told me I should use the tagline GWAS with no pain, which is maybe a little bit strong, but the basic idea is that this is a, a web interface that allows you to run GWAS by having a couple of simple commands that you put in, and all the back-end stuff is done by Encore. So it does not help you correct the, uh, um, create the right GWAS, but if you give it basically a logistic regression equation, it will run that equation for you and create um, all the result files for you. Um, doing that, yes. No, no, it's by all means. It? It's going to be populated by um, MGI data. It's not going to have phenotype. It's going to have GWAS summary stats for tons of phenotypes already. Yes. So that's different than this. That's different than this. Now, these will run your GWAS. Just like if you want specialized covariance? For example. Or if your phenotype definition is sort of, I want this fee code, or I want them to be on that medicine. Right? Okay. You, 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 you can specify that. Exactly. Right? I'll explain in a, in a second, maybe hope make a little more sense. So the, the benefit here is it also makes efficient use of cluster environment, and for the foreseeable future, the compute will be free on this because it will run on the, um, on the um, precision health uh, cluster, um, and it delivers you interactive results. To get a little bit um, closer, how would you use it? The first one is you still need to get your phenotype file, and that hasn't changed. You will still interact with data direct and um, the only thing that's different from before is that rather than saying I want the genotype information, you tell us I want to use Encore. DataDirect will create a phenotype file for you with whatever specification you come up with. Or you create a phenotype file based on what you already have. Then you upload that phenotype file as you want to use Encore. And Encore will automatically link it to the uh, genotype data and run the analysis for you. So does that make sense? So that, that, is, that is the general design we have in mind. Um, it should be usable. The plan is you can use it with your level one uh, password. And we're actually pretty optimistic that we can release that in spring 2020. Um, and then finally, the last thing that is coming out is that we're, um, yeah, that we're, um, need to genotype more individuals. The chips that we have been using so far, we have used them all up, and, but we have about 10,000 individuals where we have the DNA on hand and another 10,000 individuals that we have um, already consented and where we're collecting DNA information as we speak. So we need to move forward with this. Um, and we have used this opportunity to basically evaluate whether we want to continue using the um, core exome, was it exome core? Um, exome core array, and um, 
we have decided that we might want to switch to the Illumina uh, Global Screening Array. Um, there are several criterions for that. First one was that the Global Screening Array provides noticeably better imputation accuracy, particularly in, in um, minority populations compared to the uh, core exome array. The second one is that the um, selection of variants is just based on three or four more years of information. For example, the GSA array standard as a standard contains all the relevant pharmacogenomics markers that were known at the time of the array design. Um, we've also used this opportunity to update our custom panel. The custom panel that we've been using so far has been developed about five years ago, and we have way more genetic information now than we had five years ago. Back then, the customs panel focused on lipids variants and tried to predict where there could be a loss of function mutation. Some of these predictions were right, some of them were wrong, but as a result, about half of the customs panel that we've been using so far is monomorphic. Um, to avoid that, we went out and looked at the top Met Freeze 5 data and uh, designed a panel of roughly 44,000 uh, rare variants, um, rare loss of function variants that we could observe in the data. We tried to stick up between an allele frequency of 1% and observe it at least twice, right? If you see it once, you don't know how rare it is. Um, because we figured stuff that's more common is A, potentially in a gene that doesn't matter, or is also imputable. Um, so here you can see the minor allele count in top, meat, in top met freeze 5 of the variants that we picked. And you can see uh, there's a lot of very rare variants, as you would expect for loss of function. Um, but there's also a decent number of variants that are actually quite, quite frequent. Not quite frequent, okay, cool. Okay, so the timeline here is um, the purchase for these chips has been approved, so it's moving through the system. We hope to get the chips in spring. As I said, the, um, the DNA is ready for us to go, so we expect that those will be genotyped relatively quickly. And we're actually hoping to have a data freeze with that data in the summer of 2020. So that would then be 70,000 individuals. Um, so here's just, because I've given you a lot of dates, here's a quick overview over all, the, um, over all the things I promised and that we're hoping to achieve in the next half year or so. Um, okay, so now I use my last five minutes um, to uh, make some suggestions about other things we can do with the genetic data and we can provide for you. But as I said here, I need some guidance whether you feel that would actually be useful. Um, and the first one is we've talked about polygenic risk scores. And as we know, there's a lot of different ways to calculate polygenic risk scores. But of course, we can calculate polygenic risk scores for you, right? If you give us an equation for how to best calculate a polygenic risk score, we can just run that on our on our uh, genetic panel, and then we have for every individual, say the polygenic risk scores for the top 50 traits available. And you can either select your individuals based on polygenic risk scores, or you can do any other study where having the polygenic risk score would be useful. There's a small caveat that I would like to hear there. Polygenic risk scores need some kind of data to provide you with the weights for each variant. And these sample sizes increase all the time, so these weight files are not constant in time. And similarly, I don't believe we really yet know how to best calculate polygenic risk scores. So again, that may change. So the polygenic risk score we would provide to you would probably be good. But if you really did it yourself at the moment where you need them, they would probably be a little bit better. Okay, second thing is local ancestry. As you said, as I said earlier, we're gonna, we have some admixed individuals. Um, if in, in the new freeze, I think we have 10,000 is a little bit much. I think on the 80,000, we have about 10,000 individuals that can be expected to be admixed. Um, and some of you might be aware, admixed individuals can be th sort of be thought of as a mosaic of the different ancestral components where they get their DNA from. Uh, modeling the segmentation can be helpful for some analysis. Um, again, we have the expertise, and we have actually, we're actually doing it, for example, for TopMed, that we segment the DNA of all individuals into their ancestral components and uh, provide that to researchers. So we could do that here as well, that we provide for every individual what is their ancestral component for every aspect of the genome, um, which can be used for some 
statistical tests and potentially improve their power. Um, so that is another resource. Again, maybe the caveat I should use here, some of the most common um, statistical tests we're using for GWAS, unfortunately, cannot use local ancestry information. So it's not useful in all circumstances. And finally, um, and that's for me about one step outside of my comfort zone now, so please excuse me if I'm saying something stupid. Um, there has been a decent amount of work in using genetic data to predict uh, gene expression in different tissues. At this point, thanks to GTEx, we have a pretty good idea about a large number of uh, variants that affect uh, gene expression. And we can use that information to predict the gene expression in different individuals in different tissues. So for interpretation, of course, this is not uh, really the gene expression you would measure. This is kind of a baseline gene expression. But given that we know that a lot of the variants we observe actually if act on the genome through gene expression, it might be interesting to either compare your, uh, to, to run your analyses conditional on the gene expression of a variant rather than on the individual genetic mar markers. Okay, so to summarize real quick, uh, by the summer of 2020, we hope to be able to provide you with a sample of about 70,000 individuals, high quality imputation at least down to a minor allele frequency of 10 to the minus four. The data will be phenotypically more rich because other groups are working very hard to add, uh, add analysis, add value there, and we will continue to hopefully provide strong analytic support. So now I, this was all we do, now this is what I want you to do. Um, I think we all agree that MGI and Precision Health provide a really great resource, and other than some other places, say Vanderbilt, it's free of charge. Um, right? Vanderbilt, if you want the same data, if you want data from their data core, they will charge you. So this is free of charge, and we would like to keep it that way, right? Um, but in order to justify the expense, it needs to be used by as many people as possible. So I'm trying to deputize you here as basically ambassadors for MGI and make, other, make sure everybody's aware of this resource and knows how to use it and uses it. And on the other hand, and I have to apologize for that, I've asked you multiple times, and if you want that, you have to reapply for it. An important part for us is to document use, right? So every time you reapply, we can show, look, and somebody's interested. We're not just working for nothing. And that's one of the main reasons that we actually, when we do a major step, we ask you to reapply for it because it allows us. And similarly, if you use MGI data in grants, please let us know. If you have a paper with MGI data, please let us know. The more we can document that all the kick-ass stuff you're doing, the easier time we're having to continue doing what we're doing. Okay, and with this, obviously I want to thank all of you for all the great stuff you have already done. And I would like to know what we can do better. Quick announcement, we're gonna send out a survey either this week or potentially after Christmas so that people actually have time to look at that um, to also get more feedback in case you don't feel like saying something right now, but later or think of something, you have the opportunity there. Thank you. When you're actually running the genotypes on the chips, how are you batching the individuals on the chips? Are you mixing races? How are you doing that so you don't get a batch effect? So I don't think the individuals are there's any particular effort. To, I mean, we have some effort in our, after, in our effect afterwards to remove any batch effects, but I don't think there's a particular effort in mixing individuals as they come into the, um, into the core. So are they being genotyped in order of receipt? Pretty much. Okay. Is about right? As far as you know? Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Kristen, Kristen was oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is kind of a related question. For your fee web mm -hmm. um, tool, is that based just on the European ancestry individuals? Yes. Okay. Because we don't have it. Um, on your timeline, it, two questions came to mind, and I only remember one of them, of course. Um, so the FeeWeb with FreezeTube results, can you download entire GWAS summary stats? 
Because that, to me, is a massive amount of data that has it all even been looked at. True. Um, so we are also working on a paper describing, so, and you, Anita will talk about this later, um, about some of the analysis that happened on that, on that Freeze 2 fee web data. So maybe we can afterwards circle back to that question. Okay, but right now, can we download I all think FIWA, I think for version one, it is downloadable. There's a link if I, no? I think there that is. Been deactivated. Okay, so we, that's a good question and we need to talk about this more. Right now, I don't, th it apparently is not. Okay, and the other question I have, you talked about the custom content for the old array. Yeah. Is it available? Is it part of data sets? Is it being analyzed? So that's a little bit, right now it's, it will be available as part of the next freeze. Um, the last freeze was not exactly the way we consider a perfect freeze to go, simply because there, wasn't, there was no manpower for it. And so we were pretty, not we because I wasn't involved in that time. The powers that did it at the time were iffy about putting variants in the release data that were rather rare because there was no, right. It will be in the next freeze. Um, I'm curious, with the change in the genotyping platform, mm -hmm. what recommendations you might have about how to analyze samples from the old chip, chips, chip versions, and the new genotyping chip? Will things be called together, imputed together, no. cleaned up together so that it could be analyzed no. across both or um, separate? They will, we haven't, we will run experiments before we decide whether we impute together, but certainly not be called together because yeah. that, um, so fundamentally, given that this will be a pretty large sample, um, the easiest choice would probably be to just run them separately and then meta-analyze them. Um, that, that'll be safe. Um, we will experiment in our own fee web uh, to see what happens if you just analyze them and put an extra covariate for, 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 for batch in there. And then we can tell you more if that's okay too. Okay. I don't think that makes a big difference fundamentally in power. Yeah, okay. Thank you. That was that was very informative. Um, the UK Biobank had some problems with their imputation that they only discovered when they started doing exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were severe enough and at higher enough minor allele frequencies that you didn't need fifty thousand people. Have you, have you guys checked the imputation for? Uh, I mean, so you wouldn't obviously get most of them, but there would be at least some. 0.1% frequency variance in even uh, Kristen's 250. Oh yeah, that you on, could check and also in the custom content, there's plenty of these sites. We have not for freeze two for exactly the same reasons. We will for freeze three. Thank you. Um, in terms of other things you could do, that'd be helpful. So in the pharmacogenetics world, we're very infrequently thinking about single SNPs. We're really thinking about a patient's haplotype or diplotype using sort of well-established algorithms for translating individual SNPs into predicted activity levels, sort of like your gene expression, but this is much more well-established where you know patients poor intermediate metabolizer based on their diplotypes. For our current projects, we're each sort of individually going from single SNP data to predicted activity phenotypes. And if that's something you guys could do on your side and deliver us that data, it would be much easier for all of us to use instead of us all doing it separately. And we'd be happy to meet with you and talk to you about that. It, it's, it's a very simple process, but we're doing it each time manually, whereas you guys can do it. Yeah, oh, that's, thank you, that's a great idea actually. I actually have a, a brief follow-up to that. Um, mostly it's straightforward, but some of these metabolizer types are based on uh, copy numbers or other structural variations in the gene, which may or may not be well imputed. Uh, I mean, sometimes they are. So really what you would want would be a population-based confidence with, with the uncertainty that, with the real level of uncertainty baked into what you actually reported. And that becomes a modest, I mean, this is well within the abilities of, uh, this is a hell of a lot easier than running predict scan on things. So it's, it's not unachievable, but that is, that is what we should be handing out. Great. Um, I'll get back to you and figure out how to actually do that because it's not that I know anything about. But yeah, that oh, sounds great.
other suggestions? Any ideas about the enhanced data that I proposed? Mike, please. Um, Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, just a uh, yeah, very interesting uh, study. Um, yeah, I'm new to MGI. I really like to get involved. So my, my current expertise is more like ontology and trying to use ontology to support uh, biomedical data analysis. And now I'm working together with the kidney precision medicine project. And we are developing a couple of ontologies, including one we call it uh, OPMI, it's Ontology of Precision Medicine and Investigation. So we're trying to use it to help the KPMP to organize data. So because this is also precision medicine, I don't know if uh, what we are doing can be somehow helpful. But I, I don't know, I'm <laughs> just wondering. Yeah. yeah, we can talk about that maybe offline. OK. Um, Given that I have three more minutes, I'm just going to ask for a quick show of hands. Who think having pre-calculated polygenic risk scores would be useful to their research? Okay, that's a pretty good number. Who thinks local ancestry would be useful to their research? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, it's just the sample size is relatively small, yes. And um, who thinks that predicted expression levels would be interested, interesting to their research? OK, cool. So that's, I, I would call that noticeable interest for all three proposals, which is, <laughs> gives us the choice to do what we want to do, which is great. Um, yes? Just quick point, I think that the idea of gene expression, just that for cancer samples, that's a differentiating phenotype. It's not a stable phenotype. And the notion of trying to impute gene expression from... Oh, no, 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 no. This would not be for cancer. This would be Good. what is the baseline of cells in that individual <coughs> in circumstances roughly similar to the sample that was taken for GTEx, right? So this would never be... Great. Just never want to make the cancer. point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks. Good point. Oh, the problem with GTEx is it's underrepresentative for a number of of uh, population groups, so how do you get around that if you want to be able to do that? Because it's different. It is different, yes. Um, I don't, it's not clear that we could get around this very easily. Um, I mean, my first pass would be is do something that's agnostic to ancestry <coughs> and then look very hard at the literature and see what we can learn about um, how this can transfer. So actually, in my group, somebody is doing research on transferring polygenic risk scores. And I mean, to a certain extent, GTEx prediction is a very special kind of polygenic risk score. So we probably leverage some of that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. this is. Thank you, Sebastian, for the presentation. So my question was that you mentioned polygenic risk scores to be deposited back to the research data warehouse yep. uh, with different choices, potentially, like GWAS threshold, genomoid, and so on. Uh, but you, you mentioned 50 top diseases or 50 fee codes or so. I wanted to know a little bit more on that, because that may not be the same 50 top, which occurs commonly, because there are specialty clinics. For example, in Michigan, we have tons of skin cancer patients, but that's not really matching with the prevalence or incidence of cancer. So how would you preferentially treat those 50 sort of diseases that for which you have polygenic risk scores? I'm going to ask the people in this room who just raised their hand about po polygenic risk scores would be useful for them. I'm trying to get, I'm going to ask what would researchers be interested in, mm -hmm. right? I'm, this is, would be something that would be a service. And so I don't want to do a service that would not be used. Sure. Well, if we have something that would be of interest to people, we would yeah. use that. Because my concern is that in, in some of those top 50, the polygenic risk score may not be predictive even. So, so there are like diseases where they're not like good. Uh, so. Yes, or okay. barely predictive, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, fair. No, we would have to decide that. And 
again, I would heavily lean on the users because they can take my top 50 diseases and there'll be a lot of psychiatric stuff in there and I um, <laughs> don't think that's what everybody here is interested in.